when you start simulating, especially high speed, you need to know what S parameters mean. These S parameters will be everywhere in every simulation and everyone will just keep talking about them. To make it easy to understand this interesting topic, I ask Eric to explain it. And uh, he starts from beginning. You know, we have, we have um, kind of three different worlds. We have the real world of the physical thing that we're talking about. And here I have an example of a serial link path. You get drivers on the chip, you get the package, you get the boards, you get the backplanes, you get connectors, you get the rest of it, and then you get the receiver. That's a whole serial link as an example. That's the real physical thing. And we want to know how does that behave? Well, one way of investigating how is that going to be, how is a signal going to interact with that whole system is we can take um, uh, that system and we can go ahead and measure it. Well, how do we measure it? Well, anything above the, you know, even you know, even 100 megahertz, any, any property above 100 megahertz, it's really hard to measure it with an instrument other than a network analyzer that generates S parameters. Mm -hmm. And even if we use TDR, I'll show you in a minute that TDR is really another way of looking at the S parameters. It looks at it in the S parameters and the time domain. So I rate, I, I, I lump together the a, v, a network analyzer instrument and a TDR instrument, kind of in the same class. They're still dealing with the S parameters. And so you can measure it, but that means you have to build it first. If you want to explore how is this going to behave, well, you know, before you build it, you need, we call it in the industry, we call it a virtual prototype. Mm -hmm. We need a, a, a representation of this thing that we can calculate or simulate before we build it to know mm -hmm. how it's going to behave. And there, there are two ways of describing this electrically to, to figure out that virtual prototype. One is describing in terms of, we call it circuit elements. Circuit elements are R's and L's and C's, transmission lines, differential pairs, a couple transmission lines. These are circuit elements that every version of SPICE today understands. So, you know, LT SPICE isn't such a great one, but there's another one out there that's also free called Simplex that understands it. My favorite free SPICE tool is QUIX, Q-U-C-S, quite universal circuit simulator. It understands these circuit elements. Um, advanced tools like uh, Keysight ADS understand these elements. So that means that if you can figure out a way of translating each of these interconnect structures into RLC and mutual inductor and transmission line elements, if you can figure out how to translate them into those elements, you can build a, we call it a circuit topology model for the interconnect. And then you can simulate it. And there's a lot of value in doing that because then it's all scalable, it's parameterized. You can say, hmm, what's gonna happen if I make this transmission line longer what's going to happen to the properties? And so you can make one of the parameters of the transfer line longer, see what happens. You can say, hmm, what if I brought the return plane closer and that's going to decrease the impedance and the impedance has got smaller, what would happen to the behavior of that interconnect? I can s send signals in and look at how they respond based on that circuit topology. So these kinds of models are really, really valuable because they help us explore design space. But it's really challenging. How do you get from the geometry of each one of these elements? How do you get from that geometry to the RLC and M and, and transmission line elements? It's really hard unless you use a field solver. And some of the early field solvers uh, would literally output the transmission line model, like the, the Polar Instruments 2D field solver. It outputs the transmission line uh, parameters, the, the characteristic impedance, the time delay. Sometimes it'll give you the coupling coefficient. Sometimes it'll give you the attenuation. You can take those numbers and put them into one of these topology-based SPICE simulators and use it. So some tools give you that ability to take the geometry information and materials and turn that into these elements. But when you get more complicated structures like connectors or some of these packages with funny shaped leads and vias that go through the board and have some stubs or some of these structures that that um, go through multi layers in the circuit board some of these structures there's no easy way of converting them into these circuit topology tools the only way you can get at 
virtual prototype, that idea ahead of time is using what we the higher end tools. We refer to them as 3D full wave um, so, uh, solvers. And unfortunately, the only thing you get out of those tools, you, you can plot the electric fields, but you can't do anything with them other than look at them to, to get the behavior of the interconnect. Everybody in the industry uses S parameters. And so that's why they're valuable. There are two ways of modeling. So if we want to know the description, the properties of an interconnect, we build it and measure it, or we build a virtual prototype translating each element, each structure into circuit topology elements, or we use the full wave 3D field solver and the output of that are S parameters. So how, and, how this uh, field solver will create this model? Right. So, um, so we call that output um, a behavioral model. So we got these two different models. We got circuit topology based models and we have behavioral models. And the way the field solver generates it is it literally will uh, take that geometry information, the 3D information and the material properties. You launch a signal and a signal is defined as the initial kind of electric field that goes into the entrance to the structure. And we call the entrance where we launch the signal, we call that a port. Oh. And so we launch a signal and that signal is defined literally by the electric field. And it's generally, there are two kinds of solvers, one that solves in the time domain, one in the frequency domain. And they they both generate the same S parameters, but the one that works in the frequency will send a sine wave in a sine wave electric field, or actually it's, it's a wave, so it's an electric and magnetic field into the beginning of the interconnect. In fact, let me show you what it does in the next slide here. So it will take that interconnect geometry materials. It will synthesize the sine wave of electric and magnetic field at the beginning of the structure, at that entrance to the structure, we call that port. And it will solve Maxwell's equations based on the boundary conditions of the materials and geometries. So it literally is solving the electric fields everywhere in that structure at that frequency. And so the wave propagates and uh, and and we calculate what does that wave do when it comes back? Yeah, question. Does it mean you can only simulate uh, like tracks and, and fields around the tracks and these uh, reference uh, planes and these, but not really components? You can't really well, include... Tell me what you mean by a component. Like physical component, physical... Like a resistor yeah. or a capacitor? Right. So there are two ways of including those components. They're, those are passive components mm -hmm. as opposed to active. So two ways of including the passive components. One is where it gets mounted to the board, we just add a, another port there mm -hmm. so that... It, and, and when we take those S parameters that describe how do these sine waves interact with the structure, one of those ports would have, when we want to evaluate, how does that, how's that interconnect going to behave in my circuit? We take that S parameter model, and now wherever we have that port with the resistor, we add a resistor circuit element. So we combine the behavioral model with the discrete mm -hmm. circuit element. And then we simulate the whole thing in our circuit simulator. So it is combination of the field behavior and the circuit components? Right. And so there are some circuit simulators that will include an S parameter model, behavioral model, as a circuit element mm -hmm. and include it in the simulation. So for example, um, uh, Keysight ADS will do that. Um, uh, Siemens Mentor Graphics Hyperlinks will do that. Um, uh, let's see, what are some of the other ones out there? Uh, ANSYS has a kind of a circuit simulator built in that will take its S parameters generated in the 3D field solver. You can add circuit elements to it and look at the behavior of that combination. So it's typically the higher end tools understand how to include the S parameter behavioral model in a circuit simulation. So that's one way of doing it. And that's the most efficient way because you've already got the S parameters that's the behavioral model. You bring it in. The circuit simulator can do all those simulations really fast. You can change the value of the resistor. Um, that's really the preferred way of doing it. So wherever you're going to have a passive component, 
you add a port mm -hmm. and then you connect that element to that port mm -hmm. when you do the final circuit simulation. Mm -hmm. So, but still, then basically the S parameter will be only describing the way how the signal travels. And if you need to add this uh, resistor, then you go out of this S parameter model, you connect the model of the resistor, and then you go back to this S parameter. So, well, not exactly. So here's where you're identifying one of the limitations with an S parameter behavioral model. And I'll go back to this slide because okay. this kind of highlights it. That the problem is when I use my 3D field solver to calculate the S parameters. So literally to calculate the S parameters, I'm going to send a sine wave in at one frequency, solve Maxwell's equations as that sine wave interacts with all the, the conductors and the boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. It Some of it is going to reflect back. Some of it is going to continue and it will come out the other ports that I assign. Mm -hmm. And I literally will be calculating the sine wave that reflects back, the sine wave that comes out of each port. And the combination of the ratios of all those different sine waves at, at, at combinations at each port, at each frequency, those are the S parameters. Mm -hmm. So it is only for that specific interconnect structure. Mm -hmm. If and it takes, you know, depending on the tool and the complexity, it'll take, you know, one minute to generate the all the frequency, the S parameters and all those frequencies. It could take an hour or it could take a day mm -hmm. to calculate all of those S parameters at all the different frequencies if the geometry is really complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and so I, but it, but yeah. it is only for that structure. If I okay. want to make a change in that structure, I have to start over again. So when you say structure, it means it really is the copper and the space around the copper, not yep. really components. Right. Okay. Um, so that's the most efficient, because it takes a while to do the calculation, the most efficient way of including the components is placing a pad or, or a port where the pads are and not including yeah, that understand. component into the structure. Oh, um, okay. That's interesting. But we can take really complex structures. We can take any arbitrary connector with the VIA structure, with the, you know, Samtech uses the phrase, the, the final inch to include the, the, the traces in the circuit board, the uniform traces in the circuit board going to the VIA structure and then up through the connector and then into the next board. You can take that whole structure, bring that into a tool like ANSYS HFSS um, or Hyperlinks. Um, uh, they have a, a 3D EM or uh, ADS has a, a 3D EM solver in it. You could take that whole structure in those tools and calculate the S parameters for that structure. But if you now say, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I made the VS shorter, or mm -hmm. if I went to a different layer, you have to start over again. It's mm -hmm. another problem. Mm -hmm. And so every model, every S parameter model, we call it, we call it a point solution. It is one specific example. If I want to, explore design space and try something else, I have to go back, change the geometry, resolve all those S parameters and get another S parameter mm -hmm. file. And, and that's the downside of using the behavioral model is it's only for that specific case. Mm -hmm. If I had a representation in circuit topology, which I used estimates, for example, or a simpler s solution to translate geometry to those values, I could then change these parameter values instantly in my circuit simulation and see what happens. Mm -hmm. If I have the S parameter model for the interconnect and I bring that into my circuit simulator so it becomes one of these elements, I can then in my circuit simulator change the resistors or the capacitor values in the circuit and quickly see the result. The simulation of a circuit that is sending you know, voltages and looking at currents in my circuit simulator, sending s signals into my circuit with S parameter elements seems really fast. Mm -hmm. and, and so maybe that's one of the other differences that when we have a circuit, SPICE understands voltages and currents and RLC T elements. S parameter simulators, the simulators that create them, understand electric and magnetic fields mm -hmm. and solve Maxwell's equations and generates S parameters. Mm -hmm. So, But it's point solution. So. What is inside of the file, actually? So, do I have one? Did let's see, did I open one up here? Um, so it is literally a text file. Um, I'm just looking to see if I have one here. 
I don't have one here, but you know what? We can we can open one up. Would you like to do that? Yeah, I would like to know what is there. Okay. So so I'll tell you what it's composed of, and then we'll open it up and we'll look at it. So literally, uh, when we either we get the S parameters from a simulation, a 3D field solver, or we get them from a measurement, and we get them exactly the same way. If we simulate them, we send a sine wave in, and a sine wave only has three terms that define it. It's frequency, it's amplitude, and it's phase. So we know what it is going in. We set it up that way. And we either calculate or measure that it, the frequencies are always the same. So at one frequency, if I send one gigahertz in, I'm only going to get one gigahertz reflected or transmitted. It all interconnects with very few exceptions are, we call it linear. That is, one frequency goes in, that frequency and only that frequency comes out. So we send one frequency at a time in. I look at the one gigahertz signal coming out, and the only two things that can change are the amplitude and phase. Mm -hmm. And all the different places that I look at something coming out, the ports, we're going to measure what's or, or simulate what's the amplitude or phase of those sine waves coming out. And the S parameter, each S parameter, is literally the ratio of the sine wave coming out of some of those ends compared to the sine wave going in. And I know what it is going in because I set it up or I, I set the instrument up for it or I set up the simulator for it. So I know what that is. We measure or simulate that sine wave coming out. And when we take the rate, and so this is going to happen at every frequency. So we're literally going to have a table of frequencies and ratios of sine waves. Mm -hmm. But how do you take the ratio of a sine wave? Well, there are two numbers when you take the ratio of a sine wave. Because a sine wave has a sine wave has those two properties it, at, at a particular frequency. It has an amplitude and phase. And so the way you take the ratio of two sine waves is you take the ratio of the amplitudes, and we call that the magnitude, and you take the phase difference between them, and that's the phase of the S parameter. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to open up an S parameter file. Uh, I'm going to use uh, Notepad++. And and so you know I just happened to have been looking not too long ago at a uh, a touch uh, an s parameter file i think it was hp that introduced a standard format for the data called a touchstone file mm -hmm. and then i think it was adopted by ieee and then in 19 no in 2010 i think the ibis um committee uh took over the touchstone uh, uh file format so ibis now owns responsibility for uh, defining that touchstone standard. Um, and, and so we call the S parameter file that we generate, we call it, it is described in a touchstone format. Mm -hmm. And so here it, it's literally ASCII data. And so, so here I'm using Notepad++ to open up this so S the parameter touch, file. The, this touch uh, file um, is the same as the S parameter file? It, it is the S parameter file and it's written in the touchstone format. Okay. And the, the touchstone format defines how all of this massive amount of data is going to be uh, recorded so that if everybody uses this, I can now parse the information mm -hmm. out of this this mm -hmm. ASCII file mm -hmm. and use it in my circuit simulator or plot it up, for example. Oh, I and, see now. Gigahertz. So, yeah. what is this frequency? So, yeah, so here's the decoder file. So, in the touchstone format, Wherever I have an exclamation mark, that's a comment line. And you can put anything you want in the exclamation mm -hmm. mark. So this says, oh, I use my, this is my LaCroix wave pulse, my network analyzer to take, this is measured data. And you'll notice there's an extension of this file name. It's S4P. Mm -hmm. And this tells us how many ports I have. Mm -hmm. This says, oh, the S means I have S parameter data here. The four means I have four ports mm -hmm. and P means ports. Mm -hmm. And so knowing it's four ports, I have 16 different combinations. And so I'm going to have 16 sets of S parameter data in here. Each one is a pair of numbers mm -hmm. and they all happen at a frequency. And now the first uh, line that's not a comment has a little hash. Can you see that hashtag? Mm -hmm. Okay. That is the first line in the touchstone form that says, hey, pay attention because there's information here. And the first part of the touchstone format says, okay, the first set of characters tell me the units for frequency. Mm -hmm. It's always going to be in the first column. The next character tells me what kind of data I have here. And HP, when they established the touchstone format, 
were very smart about thinking about the future use. They said, you know, even though we're using this to store S parameter data, it's really arrays of data that are frequency dependent. So there's a frequency value, and then it's complex. There's there's a magnitude and phase or a real and imaginary for a bunch of numbers. And they said, you know, S parameters aren't the only kind of term that has a frequency and two numbers, a uh, real and imaginary or, or complex number. Impedance and admittance are the same thing. I can use this format to store admittance or impedance mm -hmm. data or other kinds of parameters. And so the touchstone format was written with that in mind. And so this letter here, S means, okay, these are S parameters, mm -hmm. but I could store impedance data, mm -hmm. admittance data, ABCD parameter data, and any other complex frequency dependent data in it. And so that's what S means, S parameters. And now when I have two numbers for each S parameter, it could be either a real and imaginary, it can be a magnitude and phase, I can, and, and I can describe the magnitude as just a fraction or in dB. Mm -hmm. And to describe those three different ways, we use three, two different letters. So MA means magnitude as a, um, as a fraction and angle in degrees. And if I had a D here, that would be the magnitude is in DB mm -hmm. and, and A is the, uh, is the angle in degrees. And so this says all of the magnitudes are just fractions, ratios of, of, of voltage amplitude coming out to the voltage amplitude going in. And then the next letter R means, hey, pay attention because now I'm going to tell you what the port impedance is of the S parameters. Because, you know, I didn't mention it, but I'll go back here. When we send a sine wave in and we look at what reflects, one of the things that influences what I get reflected, yes, yeah, about the interconnect, but it's also, I said it's like a little coax. If I built this in a little coax, what reflects depends on the impedance change from the source and the device. And so the impedance of the coax influences what I get reflected. It influences the interpretation of the S parameters. And so you have to know what that port impedance is. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, um, uh, I would, I have to know when I set up the S parameters, I have to tell the simulator, I have to tell the measurement, what's my port impedance and keep that information with it because interpreting the S parameters depends on that port impedance, important number. And when we look at the touchstone file, one of those terms after the R term is, what was the port impedance used when I generated those S mm -hmm. parameters? Yeah. We only have like very little time. So yeah. So yeah. I would like to go back to the ports. I would like to really understand how these ports work. So when you set up either the measurement or the simulation of the interconnect, you have to decide at that time, where do I want to observe the behavior of the interconnect. Mm -hmm. You can't do it, well, you can do it at every connection. So you could have, you know, 100 ports. I've seen some S parameter models that have a thousand ports. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these large BGA packages have a thousand signal IOs. Um, the more ports you have, the more calculations you're gonna have to do, so the longer it takes. So, you know, there's some practice, best practices in, in doing the partitioning to balance the complexity of the model and the computation time. Okay. Uh, but you could have a hundred ports easily. I've done many models with a hundred ports. Okay. And the port defines where I'm going to observe the behavior, okay. where it's important to me. They could be where I'm going to connect the pins to a VGA. They could be where I want to connect a resistor or a capacitor, um, or where I'm going to connect uh, a connector to the next board that I'm going to go to. So that's where you have to Think ahead of time how you want to use that model when you're done. What do you want to connect to it? Okay. Um, so, and, but you can have a hundred ports. So, and and the ground is also one of the ports, or that's not like. Right. So every port, and I apologize. I have another picture of a port. I just don't have it in this these slides here. But a port is basically a connection of where you connect a signal and its return. Mm -hmm. And when we use S parameters. 99% of the time, 
we have to be careful in setting up the S parameters because when we're solving Maxwell's equations and we're launching a, a signal in there, we, we have to have a, a ground reference in the simulation. And so usually the low side of the you know connection to an interconnect is always a signal return path. Doesn't mean anything to have just a signal pin. Just connect to a trace on a circuit board means nothing. It's, it's, it's worthless. I don't even think you can do a simulation with that. Uh, you have to have a connection to a return path. That means you have to have an idea. When a signal launches into a transmission line, there absolutely always will be a return path. You have to define when you set up that port where that is and make sure your port has the signal return. It's kind of like the way I think about a port is it's a little coax cable. And a coax cable has a signal pin and it's got the return mm -hmm. pin on the outside. The signal pin goes to the signal trace that you care about, and the the return of the coax, the outside of the coax, goes to the the local ground, whatever those ground return connections are going to be. Okay. Um, yeah. So then oh. I have another question. If you connect, for example, a resistor to this port, resistor yeah. only will have one pin and then second pin. So where do you connect the ground? Right. So if the resistor has a connection to um, uh, uh, power, so pull-up resistor or VT termination resistor, then it is possible to use what are called floating ports mm -hmm. so that the S parameters are just between those two conduct conductors. Mm -hmm. And then you just have to be a little careful when you uh, use those ports to remember that, oh, that port is a floating port and I'm going to not connect the second port, the low port to ground. It'll go mm -hmm. someplace else. So yeah. that you and you set that up when you set up the simulation environment. But when I normally see the box with the ports, there are no like two pins to the port, are they? Well, when you simulate it in a 3D field solver, you always have a connection between a signal and that return. Mm -hmm. Always. When you show the S parameter model, that you represent the icon for that model. You only have one line going into it. We have to know, we can use our engineer's mind's eye, knowing that, oh, that's a port, and a port always looks like a coax cable. Mm -hmm. okay. And so that makes it a little confusing because you you're not explicitly saying, oh, yeah, there's a coax cable port. So it means I have a signal and return connection to it. But we always have two connections to it. So a port is always signal and return. Mm -hmm. Most simulators will assume that every port is ground referenced. Oh, that explains so everything. Okay. When you put it in, and so not all I'm sorry, not all circuit simulators will use the S parameters that have floating ports. Mm -hmm. And how do That's you specify the ground downsides. for this S parameter? There is special pin in the model when you are doing this in model. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. So the S parameter icon, the model itself, when you bring it into a circuit simulator, has a ground pin, a common mm -hmm. ground pin to it that's connected to node zero effectively in your circuit simulator. Okay, and that's something different. It's not really port. You would not see it here like a port. It's special dedicated right. pin for ground. Right, and that's only for use in a circuit simulator. Mm -hmm. okay. The S parameters themselves have inherently in them the assumption that each S parameter term, the S11 or S41 or 31, each one of those terms assumes that I'm sending a signal into that port between the signal and its return path. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not explicitly showing it here, but when I have this squiggly wind, this little sine wave, I'm assuming that is the voltage waveform between the signal and return of that coax mm -hmm. cable of that port. And so when I connect, when I show these two sine waves, it's as though I have one coax cable connecting to this connector of this port, this pads of this of the circuit board here. And on that coax, I have two waves traveling. I have an incident wave and I have a reflected wave. And my simulator or my network analyzer has to be smart enough to separate in that single coax, what is the signal, the sine wave propagating into the device and what's the sine wave that's coming out of it mm -hmm. because they are going in opposite directions. I can separate them out, mm -hmm. but it requires a little bit of technique to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's one coax that connects and on it, I'm going to have a wave, 
going in and a wave coming out at the same time. And so you asked about, well, is one an input and one an output? The answer is they will all alternately be inputs and outputs. Mm -hmm. And the complete combination of all those combinations, like I have four, this here's an interconnector, a circuit board trace or connector that's got four different ports on it. I label them with numbers to keep track of them. And I will have, when I describe the S parameters of this interconnect, that behavioral black box model, I will have every combination of a going in and a going out and a coming out as pairs. Mm -hmm. I will have a S11, an S22, so a sine wave will go in and I'll look at what comes out. I'll have an S33, S44, I'll have an S21, go in on port one, come out on port two. I'll have an S31, I'll have an S43, okay. I'll send a signal into four and I'll look at what comes out three. Every combination. So if I have four ports, I have 16 combinations. That means I've got, and each one of them has two numbers, a magnitude and a phase, and they're going to be at each frequency, a huge number of, of numbers that are in that model. Mm -hmm. What I would like to make clear is on what part we need to look at. Right. Okay. So you know, this is not a great example, but here, here's my network analyst in my lab. I've got this board that's got a lot of ports on it. And I only have four ports on my network analyst, only four measurements. But if I did a simulation, I could have 20, 25 ports on my circuit. And I could get the S parameters in my all 25 ports calculated all at once. That would be a an S25P file. Mm -hmm. And I'd have 25 times 25 What's that? 625 different S parameters with all those combinations. Now you're asking, well, I've got the 625 different combinations or 25 ports. What do I look at? Exactly. If, That's exactly if, my question. Yeah. If I only cared about, well, I just want to know, how does this trace look? What is, how does it behave? Remember those S parameters, when we generated the, the 25 port S parameter file, it was a virtual prototype. It was as though I had the device in front of me, just like I have here in my network analyzer, and I'm gonna do a measurement of it. But now it's as though I did simultaneously 25 different measure, 20, I did measurements, 25 ports. If I only care about, let me look at just this one interconnect. I have to ask the question, when I look at this interconnect, what do I think the connections to the other ports are gonna be? In other words, are they going to have terminations on them? Are they going to be open? Are they going to be grounded? Or are they just going to sit there floating? If there's no coupling between the trace I worry about, I care about, I want to know about, and the other interconnects, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If there's no coupling. If I think there's going to be crosstalk, and I might care about how much coupling is there going to be, then whether I terminate the other lines, or I leave them open, or I short them, I'm going to see them interacting with this interconnect a little differently. All those combinations may give me a slightly different result. Mm -hmm. And so you, when we ask, tell me about the properties of this interconnect, the, the, the answer depends a little bit about how that interconnect interacts with everybody else. Mm -hmm. but and it, sometimes yes. that's really important information. Okay. If we don't care about the other, then we would show, for example, graph for ports one and two, correct? Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Or it could be, hey, this is really port 15 and this is port 16. And then I would take those 25 by 25 S, that, that S parameter model. I'd leave all the others floating mm -hmm. and I'd only connect. I'd only look at the connection to port 15 would have my signal source in my simulator and port 16 would be the output. And I'd send a step edge in, or I'd send sine waves in, depending on how I wanted to look at it. It's a behavioral model. It's a circuit element in my circuit. I can look at it in any way I want. Mm -hmm. I can just um, put my driver and whatever, you know, PRBS signals come into that driver, I can send it through here and look at how it would appear on the other end. Okay. I and understand. I can do that individually to any other network, any other um, uh, connection, or I could even uh, drive four of these with PRBS signals, and I'd look at the fifth one and look at the crosstalk mm -hmm. on it. That's that's how we partition when we set up those S, the, the, the model that we calculate the S parameters for. That's when we decide what coupling do we want to pay attention to. That defines 
which nets or which uh, yeah which which nets do we connect ports to and which do we not care about and not connect anything to mm -hmm. so we we have just touched on a little introduction about s parameters and what are they and what do they look like and how we might use them um there's i've done a, a number of webinars on this topic kind of an introductory level like this to introduce engineers to the concept of s parameters and if you just open this up here are a whole bunch of webinars about s parameter measurements here mm -hmm. and so, you mentioned you are going to do a live uh, webinar i am so it's live streamed only september 29th to 30th um the it's going to be about transmission lines thank you so much eric hey robert it's always a pleasure chatting with you and i look forward to our next chat and uh, that's everything for this video Thank you very much, Eric, for this great interview and thank you for watching, liking and commenting. We are preparing some very interesting tutorials, so if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our Fedevel online courses where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again and see you next time. Bye.